Hi there. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the WESIS webinar. We're so thrilled to have panelists from Microsoft, our strategic partner here, and it's behind the scenes with Microsoft Security Panel. My name is Lynn Dome, and I'm Women in Cybersecurity Executive Director. We often go by our acronym, WECYS, and it's spelled W-I-C-Y-S. We pronounce it WECYS, like we sisters, because that's exactly what we are. We're a global cyber sisterhood, and our mission is to recruit, retain, and advance women in cybersecurity. We have over 7,000 members with representation in over 70 countries. And we have 56 professional affiliates. Professional affiliates are mini WESIS organizations. They're all throughout Africa, Australia, Canada, France, India, Pakistan, Norway, Israel, the UK, and throughout the United States. We have also specialty affiliates in artificial intelligence, BISO, critical infrastructure, cloud security, data privacy and cybersecurity law, LGBTQ plus pride, colors of inclusion, Latinas, neurodiversity, and military, all in cybersecurity. And in addition to all of that, we have over 200 student chapters with Microsoft Philanthropies funding a global student chapter initiative. So that's our community alone. What we do is we provide opportunities and layer it with resources. And these are many of our initiatives that we have going on right now. We offer scholarship grants and awards not only to our conference, but to other conferences as well. We have Cyber Talent Emergency Fund for our members to receive up to $599 within 48 hours of submitting for emergency fund. And that's a student-only emergency fund. So that's used for rent or books or if their car breaks down because all those essential items and financial needs are important to stay fine-tuned and in your cybersecurity studies. We have a speaking and media opportunities, a job board plus plus that has a huge resume database and our strategic partners like Microsoft post their jobs in. We have apprenticeships, internships, leadership series, leadership summits, a mentor mentee program that's going to be opening up again for its third year enrollment. And that's where we designed and developed a curriculum to upskill and up level women no matter where they're at in their careers, preparing them for their next level of advancement. All of this and so much more. And we owe all of that thanks to our strategic partners here. And we're thrilled that Microsoft as a strategic partner was able to put this panel together. So you have an incredible panel here. We're excited. We can't wait to just dive right into those questions. And, and we want to encourage you as attendees of the program here to be able to ask those questions. So at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat function and our panelists will be answering them live. And if, we ha if you haven't done so already, I'd encourage you to subscribe to the WESIS newsletter so that you stay up to date with all the latest and greatest of what WESIS has to offer. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the mic on over to Stephanie and she's gonna take this panel from here. Thank you so much, Lynn, and thank you for having us. Um, and thank you for everyone who's joining us today. On behalf of the entire, entire panel, um, we're really glad to see you and to get your questions. My name is Stephanie Calabrese, and I'm a Principal PM Manager at Microsoft. For those of you that can't see me, I have medium length blonde hair, a black top and black jacket, and I'm standing at my desk in my office in the Microsoft campus. I wanna share a quick fun fact with you about myself. In our house, we take pizza very seriously. We have this fabulous, great pizza oven that's outside that really we only get to use maybe three months out of the year because there's lots of rain in Seattle. Um, we're always trying new doughs out and it's, it's really exciting for us. I've been with Microsoft just about 10 years now. I've been in cloud security for over seven years and my team manages some of the most exciting um, programs at Microsoft in my unbiased opinion, of course. We manage Blue Hat, we manage the researcher engagement, and we do also the internal security training at Microsoft. I am privileged to work with some of these wonderful women that are on the panel here. Um, and so we're going to ask them to introduce yourself. Abalasha, can we start with you? Hello, everyone, and I'm really happy to be here with you today. As Lynn was going through the kind of things that Rhesus has to offer, it's extremely heartwarming um, to hear about that and be part of this. So for those who can't see me, I'm about five feet, three inches. You can't figure it out in the camera anyways, but I'm that tall. And I have shoulder length black hair. I'm wearing a dark blue shirt and a pink coat. A fun fact about me is uh, that I love art and classical music. 
and I love doing those things with my kids. You know, being a mom is one of the most, it is the most important thing. And uh, uh, doing every sharing both cybersecurity, music and art is something that we do as a family. We also like to paint our entire cul sac you know, in occasions, whether it's Halloween, Easter, you know, and all the good uh, occasions we can get. I have been with security for over two decades now, and uh, currently I'm a partner security architect at Microsoft, and I'm responsible for monitoring and coverage, and I'm part of a Microsoft Security Response Center. Uh, for those who may not have uh, heard about it before, it is the frontline defense for millions of customers all around the world and all who use Microsoft products. And um, the passion and the dedication of the team is something I can't speak enough of. I was with Intel for 14 years previously, and I worked on hardware-based security, and I did my doctorate from Purdue University where I focused on identity, cryptography, and biometrics. So I, again, couldn't uh, be more thankful for being part of this group and then committed to building a cybersecurity platforms that build a fearless, innovative, um, and a very positive platform and experience for all our users. Thank you. Aditi, can you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Thank you. VC for inviting us and um, uh, hi everyone, I'm Aditi Shah. I um, am a short Indian woman with long black hair and I'm wearing a brown jacket. I've, um, you know, just like Stephanie said, like they take pizza very seriously for me. I take fiction very seriously. So I'm a super crazy fan of all the fiction books out there. I read at least one every week. And when I pick up a book, nobody can stop me till I finish it. So just to give you an example, I read all the seven Harry Potter books in seven days straight um, at a time. So that's how crazy I am. Um, about me, um, I've been in security for almost a decade now. I've worn many different hats. I started my career as a software engineer building a privileged identity management solution. There, after I did product management for a bit, and for the last three years, I've been doing machine learning for security. Right now, I work with Microsoft Security Research as a senior research engineer. Great. Thanks, Aditi. Olivia, can we go to you? Yes. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, hi. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Olivia Hugel. Um, I work as a security service engineer at Microsoft, supporting monitoring, monitoring and detections to help protect Microsoft and its customers. For those who cannot see me, I'm a young woman with light brown hair, wearing a blue sweatshirt and a black vest. I'm sitting down at my desk in my home office. Um, a fun fact about me is that I love to go hiking. Last year, I was able to travel and hike in six different states and visit four national parks. I'm early in my career and I joined Microsoft right out of college almost two years ago, working in security operations engineering. Even throughout school and internships, I've always been more hands-on with my experience. So it's great that Microsoft has a lot of teams where um, you can be super hands-on with, um, with customers and just with the um, tools that we have here. And, one of the most rewarding aspects of supporting a security team at Microsoft is the broad and direct impact of the work that we get to do every day in securing both internal employees and, again, our external customers and partners as well. Awesome. Thank you. And Amanda. Thanks for introducing me. Hi, everybody. It's Amanda Russo, also known as Malware Unicorn. Um, so I've been at Microsoft for less than a year now. I think I joined in, in May. Um, I'm currently working on the Microsoft Offensive Research and Security Engineering team, doing vulnerability research and engineering. Um, this is all new to me, so I've uh, had many hats across my career, both blue team and red. Um, so I like jumping around uh, and learning new things. I think that's one of the things I'm passionate about is just learning and problem solving. Um, a uh, fun fact about myself, uh, I can juggle and ride the unicycle at the same time. <laughs> uh, I have a lot of other hobbies but and other talents, but uh, that one's probably the, the funniest one. 
That's my favorite. That's my favorite. And, you know, honestly, let's let's talk a little bit about your other talents. So the first time you and I met was almost a year ago. We were at a dinner together for um, celebrating International Women's Day. And you came in and you were wearing this incredible outfit. And I was like, oh, my gosh, it looked like Burberry. I was like, this is fabulous. I was like, where did you get this? And you said, I made this. And you told the story about, you know, you went to school and I'll let you tell that story, but it's pretty unconventional how you got into cybersecurity. So can you can you tell us a little bit about your path to security? Sure, for sure. You know what? I had no idea I would be I would end up in this job. Um, I actually went to my undergrad. I went to school for graphic design. Uh, I actually did like a study abroad in Florence where I did Italian Renaissance art and everything. Um, but then I realized, you know, that's probably not going to pay the bills. Uh, so one day my dad asked me to uh, attend a class for my brother so that he wouldn't fail his computer science class. Well, he eventually failed anyways, but I kept going. I turned out to be one of the, you know, few girls in the department. I became a, a tutor, um, a lab instructor, you know, I really took to it. Uh, so I came out with both like uh, computer uh, computer engineering and um, graphic design on my way out. Uh, landed a job at the Department of Defense doing forensics. That was where I learned everything on the job. Uh, did everything from like major crimes to, you know, uh, what is it, uh, uh, domestic terrorism and all that. So it's been a, a interesting ride. Um, from there, I did like uh, commercial incident response, uh, came to the Bay Area to work at FireEye doing VM rules, uh, did some EDR development at Ingame. I think they're called Elastic now, uh, worked at Facebook's Red Team for a little bit for a couple of years, and now I'm at Microsoft doing vulnerability research. So it's been a fun ride. That's awesome. We're very lucky to have you. And speaking of unconventional stories, Aditi, it's difficult being a woman in tech and specifically security, but you had an additional challenge to face as a woman with a disability. Can you tell us about your path to security and then ultimately to Microsoft? For sure. So my path into security has definitely been very interesting. Um, so when I was a kid, I was diagnosed with a retinal condition which deteriorates your vision. So by the time I turned 15, I turned totally blind. Um, and at that time, a lot of people, you know, everyone who knew me said that I should study something more theoretical, you know, something like literature or music, something that would be easier for me to study without sight. Um, but I was really, really fascinated with computers at that time. And I had this dream that I wanted to be a software engineer. But that, that time, I didn't know anybody who was blind and was studying computer science. However, I just decided to do it anyway. Um, and, you know, the journey, again, was difficult but interesting. Um, I graduated at the top of my class. But, again, something interesting happened that no tech company, and I was in India that time, and no tech company had uh, that point was ready to interview me because they'd never seen a blind software engineer in their life. They did not think that blind people could code. So I started working as a freelance software developer. Um, and while I was doing that, one of my clients really liked my work and they decided to hire me full time. And fortunately for me, that happened to be a data center security company. I worked there for a few years. And while doing that, I really fell in love with cybersecurity as a domain. And I wanted to grow my skills in this area. So I applied to a few schools in the US and I came to US, um, joined the master's in cybersecurity program at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And after graduating, I've been working with Microsoft Security since three years. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, Olivia, there are very few people who are actually coming out of university with a security background. Um, and you hit the ground running when you came out of school. Was that intentional? So my pathway into the security industry right out of school was definitely intentional, but I wouldn't say it was always this way. 
I come from a background more of computer science and software development, so I wasn't initially aware of all the overlaps that can happen with other fields, such as cybersecurity. Um, I first became exposed to different roles in other fields through attending the Grace Hopper Conference. And for those of you unfamiliar with what Grace Hopper Conference is, it's the largest gathering of women in technology. So this was where I was able to meet people in all kinds of different roles and industries all coming together from different backgrounds. And from going to this conference, I was able to land an internship position just completely by chance in cybersecurity on an incident response team over at Honeywell, which is where I got that hands-on experience in a security operations center or a SOC. And this is really what sparked my passion for cybersecurity, and I could see myself pursuing a career in this field. So after that internship, I was able to return to school for my final year, take more security-focused elective courses, join security clubs, and then just strengthen my security skill set to really kick off my career right out of school. So, so I would say I would it was a combination of like the conference strengthening my soft skills and then those courses strengthening my hard skills that just allowed me to sharpen my background in security out of school. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, let's transition a little bit. Let's talk about what it's like with the, the work that we do daily, particularly at, at Microsoft. So Abalasha, you're a partner, as you mentioned, a partner architect at Microsoft. What does your day-to-day -day look like? What do you do each day? Yeah, um, I would love to first recognize like all the inspiring stories. And I see in the comment uh, for a question from a fellow um, Purdue students, so you know, so just you know, stay at it and boiler up. Um, being a partner at Microsoft is basically a lot of um, you know, a partner just like the name as it implies is about collaboration and being a partner to many amazing engineers like you see on the screen right now and being able to unblock and help um, help them succeed. And when you do that, you this abundance mentality, similar to when Lynn was talking about visas, there's so many diverse ways of uh, trying to achieve a goal. It could be through technical excellence, could be through policy, et cetera. And how you do that is by enabling each other, you know, being, uh, being supportive. And one of the things that I, um, I do like to do is to take every person and live by the mantra of mutual respect. You, even in this small panel, you see all of us with very, very diverse experiences and paths. And when, as a partner, I get to meet with all the wonderful people, it's long days, I won't lie. It starts really early and with the global nature of our company and the follow the sun model, as Olivia was saying, the security operations center or the SOC has the responsibility to protect customers all around the world. So it is a, a tireless job and in terms of making sure uh, that we protect our customers no matter what. And uh, a lot of us are remote. We are joining uh, and we are in back-to-back -back meetings and we are working with response teams, product teams, managing incidents, but also taking a step back and saying, hey, what is the right architecture? How, what does it take for us to get ahead of the adversaries? So I spend a lot of time learning, just doing my research and it is from each other you know being uh, making sure that we collectively aditi has uh, was the one who introduced me to the most up-to-date ml techniques i've learned a ton from aditi olivia in my day-to-day -day just interaction we learn from each other i would also highly encourage folks to take the time to learn um, no matter how busy you get uh, the biggest strength is that combination of learning um, the hard and soft skills, like Olivia mentioned, and as a partner, it's not just about being an individual contributor. It's about one, connect, you know, be authentic, listening, as well as two, the most important thing is to support, you know, help unblock, as I mentioned, and three is to help grow and develop. Because once you have a strong team, you have uh, a, a very strong talent pipeline, you know, you have your way forward. So for me, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I couldn't be more grateful and the gratitude goes a long way. Yeah, and uh, I do also like to balance my time in the evenings with my family because the, uh, balanced, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. We, we cannot think the complexity and the urgency without being able to have that 
time to yourself. So it is a very nice day. At the end of the day, it's a very rewarding experience knowing the positive impact that we've had as a team to the society as a whole. Yes, I, I often tease you that I think you might actually have a twin because you do so much and you drive so much impact at Microsoft Appalachia. It's, it's really wonderful and it's such a, a pleasure to work with you. You mentioned um, Olivia and Aditi with machine learning. Machine learning is kind of hot right now at, at Microsoft. Olivia, can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on? Sure, so I work on one of the many security teams at Microsoft and that team is called EDG Security, which stands for Edge and Platform Devices and Gaming Security. We're responsible for secure services and software, protecting critical assets, monitoring and response and governance risk and compliance. So we proactively identify risk and ensure that we're building products and services that comply with all steps of the security development lifecycle. About 30% of my responsibilities would include reactive threat hunting. So this would look like triaging and responding to, um, to incidents or um, active cases as part of our team's on call. And the next, the next 40% would go towards proactive planned work. So this would look like developing some automation solutions or creating detections to put into place in order to detect threat actors. And then the remaining 30% would look like collaboration with other security teams at Microsoft on engagements such as purple teaming or um, different engagements like that. Um, one thing I did want to highlight, though, about EDG security um, team at Microsoft is the gaming aspect. And along with that, one of Microsoft's biggest products or services is the Xbox gaming ecosystem. So as you can, ma can imagine, it's very impactful um, to be able to protect millions of users gaming information online from different threat actors. And being able to protect against things like gaming leaks, which can happen online, and ensuring that there isn't any game cheating or game game abuse happening in the world of Xbox. So it's definitely a large part of some of the services that my team works to protect daily. I'm sure that's a, a very busy <laughs> role that you have with um, trying to keep our, our customers safe in the gaming space. So so thank you. Aditi, you also focus a lot on machine learning right now. And if anyone's been watching the news, of course, we've got Bing, we've got big things coming out. Um, what can you share with us that you're working on? Sure. So, you know, like you mentioned, uh, machine learning or AI and, you know, chat GPT has really transformed how we do things, you know, how we search the web or how we get help, how we do meetings. Um, it's everywhere, you know, your virtual assistants and everything. So my role is really about using all this advancement in machine learning technology. I specifically focus on natural language processing, which is using all the large language models um, that are out there for security scenarios. So we primarily begin um, with, you know, some of the easy low hanging fruit use cases um, which are around automation. So, you know, as, as the incidents come in and as the vulnerabilities are reported to Microsoft, how do we use artificial intelligence to automate some of the things that uh, the human responders or the analysts are doing? Um, like, how do we automate these? How do we augment, assist these people so that they can do more? So really uh, focusing on uh, building models that kind of map one on one into all of these workflows is one of the things like uh, Olivia mentioned. So we have models that do automated triage, do automated assessment and a lot of those things. Um, along with that, um, you know, as, as a lot of digital transformation has happened, the amount of data that are, is generated from our digital assets has really increased so much. And as humans, we can only think in limited dimensions, right? Like three dimensions, four dimensions, but our data is so big. And that's where machine learning really shines, you know, from understanding what are those normal patterns of behavior to helping us find anomalies, like really finding those abnormal behavior patterns. Um, machine learning is very good at that. So we are using machine learning to find patterns in our data, uh, dig up all the insights and a lot of those things. And lastly, as Olivia, uh, Olivia mentioned, like 
we also have to do proactive um, response. So what can we do? Like, where can we leverage uh, some of these natural language processing advancements to catch those adversaries before they do the harm? You know, even, even if they talk about it, we want to monitor the entire web uh, and beyond to make sure that we catch some of these exploits before they are sold and used. So really uh, applying AI in some of uh, those areas as well. It truly is an art and a science, right? Yes. The work that you do. So, well, thank you for thank you for that. And then Amanda, as a principal researcher um, in security research, you not only look at the minute details, you also have to look at the big picture. So can you tell us a little bit about what you do and what the skills are that people would need to be successful in the type of role that you have? Yeah, so since my focus is mainly vulnerability research, we're trying to tackle problems that go across multiple orgs and multiple products. Um, and since everything is based off of the Windows OS, uh, that's where we try to tackle these issues, at least at least for my team. Um, you can't just focus on fixing one bug in one program, right? Maybe there's like an underlying problem with how the, the, the compiler was, was configured, or maybe it's something with how people are, are um, allocating memory. What if that's wrong? Or how they're handling strings. It's something that you have to figure out, like what's the biggest impact that you can make um, to solve the problem. Um, so, for skill, my skill set, I find that problem solving, like the soft skills, problem solving um, for technical skills, reverse engineering, it's not an easy, it's a not an easy skill to do. But once you have it, you can be in multiple different jobs. Uh, basically, it's taking things apart, debugging, uh, trying to break things down and figure out what's wrong or what's going on and building them back up, um, having a strong uh, foundation in programming and security and, and all these different types of fields. I think when you're, when you're a security person, you have to tell developers what to do. And if you don't know what, what they do, it's kind of like, well, why are you telling me what to do if you don't know how to do it? <laughs> so you really have to have a breadth of, uh, of expertise to be in security, unless you're like pigeonholing yourself into like one area like forensics or uh, red teaming, you know, you'll have th this, there's still similar skills, I would say, and, and I've spoken at Black Hat London for this, um, you need to remove the idea of different colors, different team colors, there's no red, there's no blue, uh, you, st you both sides have the same skill set, it's just how you apply it for a certain purpose. So are you saying that developers push back and question you? Amanda? <laughs> <laughs> generally, generally, like even when I did red teaming, if you like present a bug to them or you present like a vulnerability to them, like, oh, no, 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 how how can I, I don't have time to, to do this. How how can I, as a, a person who revealed the bug, show the, the gravity of the situation without, oh, you know, yeah. you know, I have to bring data to the, the table. I have to bring examples, scenarios, everything to convince the developer, like this is something that you need to fix. Yeah, so, I think that's something we all face, right? People can look at security as attacks and you don't realize that, you know, I talk to engineers all the time and I'll say, are you a security engineer? And they say, no, but you're like, in fact, everyone who's an engineer really needs to have that security mindset. So that's why it's important the work that we do to, to help educate people to, to keep customers and really the world safe. So thanks for that. I think you guys said, if I may just add one thing, because what, uh, what Amanda was saying is a very important point and you said it beautifully, Stephanie, on that security mindset. Mm -hmm. Work like that has built, has uh, resulted in a change, a mindset uh, shift, uh, even in the whole industry. We saw it at Blue Hat last week, where a lot of the different red team, blue team, purple team coming together to not only identify uh, problems, but driving the fixes together to raise the bar together. And you'll see a lot of this theme coming up, and it's all because of this joint great work and the secure coding and practices I've seen at Purdue and seen other colleges too. So thank you for keeping us honest and driving improvements like that. So we, we've talked a little bit about how, you know, it's it's a, a challenging space to be in in security and we all have our work that we do, but 
we also like to to give back to the communities. And Aditi, I want to start with you. You kind of shared that you started, you know, as a challenge. I know that other folks wouldn't want to, um, you maybe wouldn't have perse persevered as much as you did. And so how are you helping others today that have disabilities feel welcome in the community? Yeah, I think um, the biggest thing for me is that, you know, when you take the path less traveled, you, you know, you don't have role models. Like I didn't have anybody who was showing me what was possible. So I think with everything that I do today, um, I'm showing what's possible to a lot of people like me. So that's definitely one of the things I do. Um, I also take uh, every opportunity to mentor um, students with disabilities as well as young women who want to pursue a career in cybersecurity or STEM in general. Um, I volunteer with a bunch of different not-for-profits, both here in the US as well as back in India to work with children who might not be as privileged as me to get the right set of opportunities at the right time. So just working with them, helping them build the right soft skills and hard skills, like Amanda mentioned. So, you know, just being there for them, um, helping them, training them, mentoring them, and just uh, making sure that they do not give up. So I work with a different set of organizations to do that. and just help everyone who reaches out to me because you know, I, I really believe um, that we succeed when we help others succeed. So helping everyone that needs um, my help uh, is the way I kind of try to pay it forward. I love that, thank you. Um, Amanda, let's just, if, you, if people don't know who Amanda is, um, she's also known as Malware Unicorn. She's really considered one of the the best in the world at what you do. Um, you're obviously very busy. How do you help bring the next generation of of women and people into this um, into your field? Ah, uh, well, this is a big one for me because I didn't have any of this going through college or going through early in my career, and I feel like it's very, very important, like a, a very important passion of mine to give back to the community. Um, Right now, I do free workshops and, and free VMs on my own website for reverse engineering. I used to teach every year at DEF CON. I volunteer every year on the CFP review board for DEF CON. I used to host meetups in San Francisco at different uh, locations to help, you know, drive people together and, and talk about different topics like machine learning, uh, you know, offensive security, um, uh, all different topics. Uh, and I keep trying to be involved in the community and, and trying to connect people. I think the biggest thing is picking a few folks to mentor every once in a while to get them like just their foot in the door. So um, it's, it's a lot of things. <laughs> and, and now that I have a, a, a two-year-old, it's really harder to keep up with that, but I still try on my downtime to, to, to be involved. So you're starting at home with the next generation, right? You're gonna... Yes, exactly. She's already been trying to hack my iPad. So <laughs> that's awesome. So we, um, I, I love the the trainings that you offer. We actually put an announcement in there with a link to your trainings, which are all free for people. So hopefully, people can take a moment um, if they want to learn a little bit more about reverse engineering. They can check that site out. Um, we talked to Olivia about how you came right out of college and you went right into security. You got passion when you were working in your um, in your internship. What advice would you give to someone very early in their security career or just starting their security career? So I think really similar to what Aditi had mentioned was um, the, the the theme of mentoring and relationships has always been really big for me. Um, and just finding your community. And it can go both ways, right? Like it can be seeking out a mentor for career guidance and helping to build your sense of community, but it can also look like serving as a mentor to others. So volunteering for different programs or just making yourself available when people reach out to you or something like that. And I know mentorship has definitely helped me build my sense of sense of community and security and just help me become more comfortable and confident in those conversations, which can sometimes be super uncomfortable. Like driving your career with your manager or just battling imposter syndrome. And 
these can affect anyone, not just people who are early in career. So whether you're early in career or senior in career or even transitioning in career, I, I can't stress enough the importance of being part of some kind of community or building a building a community yourself through mentoring and building relationships. You know, it's, it's funny you mentioned um, imposter syndrome. Someone asked a question about that, which we can talk a little bit more about later. But it, it's funny. I think that many people, and I say people, suffer from imposter syndrome. I think that sometimes we think that this is a, a woman thing, right? We're like, oh, as women, we suffer from this. But I talk to, to people on my team. I talk to colleagues. And it's actually a, a shared <laughs> feeling that a lot of people have. So, so we're not alone in it. But it's just how do we overcome that? Um, which is, you know, having those conversations with people, having trusted mentors. So I love that you that you brought that up, Olivia. Abalasha, what is your advice to it's women in tech or in security who want to help contribute to the, gr the growth of others, right? Because there are people who are at all levels of their career. And, you know, even Olivia, I'm sure, can provide mentorship to newer people. As you go up, you can you go back and forth between where you're contributing. How would you suggest people be able to give back to the community? Yeah, and we saw a lot of that right now, like Amanda's contributions, Aditi, Olivia, yourself, like there are so many um, initiatives that are out there and that being able to mentor and get, uh, it, it takes a village truly, you know, to be able to support each other and uh, help open options and opportunities that never existed, right? And it is a sobering time, you know, for so many things that are happening, we really need to make sure we are there for each other. I really like to have call for action, like having mission driven things that we want to go deliver. We are very result oriented, right? And one ask is being able to help, like I see folks who are at college and are, uh, and are getting really good education, but give women who are applying for cybersecurity jobs a fighting chance to get that job. And uh, to be able to do that, it takes careful study, understanding, hey, what is the training that you've got? Do you, um, If you can't get a full degree, depending on your focus area, perhaps a certification, pointing to the right trainings as we just did, the mentoring as Olivia was mentioning, the outreach that Aditi mentioned, like there is so much out there, but when they apply for the job, it is not just a checklist. It allows you to make sure that you can actually land that job. And um, it is not just about one and done. Like I've been doing this for two decades now and I learn every single day. So our field is evolving constantly. What is uh, hot today, you know, and there are things which will get hotter over a period of time. So constant learning, thinking holistically and uh, bias is aside, I think women are very good at that multidisciplinary approach. Uh, you might be feeling that right now, Amanda, with your two-year-old, two like juggling things. It, it really does take um, looking at things from very different aspects. And if there are women who are from healthcare or from the pandemic hit us all, right? And if they are coming from diverse fields, uh, to help them embark on their journey with cybersecurity as a whole career, let's let's start, uh, let's help them get what is needed. And we, as Microsoft, have a lot of programs that are there for outreach and help. So please, any ideas that would be good. I'm passionate about one thing because my kids are at middle school, high school level at this point and starting earlier in the career. Um, when I first joined college, people were telling me, hey, you know, you newbie. Um, I, you know, I've been coding since I was four. I was like, great, um, you know, but at that time also, I, I felt like the biggest thing was just being fearless and learning it all, but helping our kids um, to not, um, to hack those iPads early or <laughs> to learn the ethics of it or to be able to uh, build on each other's strengths, you know, and, and just advocate, you know, advocate, you know, help build each other, make new leaders. I think that's how we're going to help the whole community. I love that. And I'd also like to even add, like, almost be unapologetic in things. And I, I say that because I've been sitting here, we've been on for about 40 minutes, and I've been sitting in absolute fear that my uh, nine-year-old is going to come opening this door because he's locked out of his switch that I've given him to uh, not come in and bother. Midwinter break, everyone. Sounds great. Um, but 
we've kind of learned through the pandemic that people can be more forgiving of things. We don't have to always um, apologize for things. We have to give ourselves grace, you know, especially us that are parents or, you know, people are at all different stages of our life taking care of, of other family members. And I think that it's okay to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and giving ourselves a break, but being able to be focused on our career. So don't be afraid to, you know, take care of yourself and do what you have to do as well. So just to, just to add to that. Beautiful. We've got a lot of great questions coming in. Um, hopefully we can get to them all. The first one I'm going to start with, um, Amanda, I'm going to ask you. Um, I'm just going to read it out. A friend of mine spoke to me about cybersecurity some days ago. I've been researching on the field since then and so found one could thrive without a background in tech. I do not have a background in IT. How do I begin my journey and grow in this field? Okay, so one thing I want to mention, do you have an adversarial mindset? And let me let me just preface this on, let me give you an example. So say I'm at a uh, pancake restaurant and I, you, I, I tell you, how can you get a, some pancakes for free? So what is the, the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, well, you just go in and take the pancakes, right? So obviously, that's not going to happen. You're, the the uh, cashier is going to say, hey, you can't steal those pancakes. Um, you could give the cashier fake money for the pancakes. Obviously, it's free because you don't actually have to pay for it. Uh, another extreme example is you pull the fire alarm and everybody leaves and then you take the pancakes. So there's these different levels of trying to solve the problem creatively. Um, and having that mindset means that you can figure out how to game the system. So for instance, you're trying to get a career in cybersecurity. So what is the first thing you do? I want to be a security engineer. I'm gonna go look up all of the requirements that you have to have as a security engineer. And then I'm gonna see how do I achieve those requirements? And you don't have to be an expert in all of them. You can have like a, a dabbling of something because you can learn on the job. So not everything that they have on the requirements list has to be something that you meet. I think the only reason why folks actually get through the system is because of their automated recruiting system that key on certain tag words in your resume or what you put on the application. So you have a loose understanding of what is required. So how do you get those things? Well, there's a lot of like online content, like um, open security info. Um, you can do certs, you can sign up for certs. Obviously they're gonna be a bit expensive, but you can actually just get the books anyways and start learning. Even if you don't have certs, you can still apply and go through the, the, the interview process. The more interviews you have under your belt, the easier it is for you to get through the interview process. A lot of the Bay Area interviews have like six six back-to-back -back interviews in a row dealing with like soft skills, uh, programming, um, security concepts, and just like overall knowledge. So a lot of these things, you, you just have to experience. It's like, uh, how are you gonna win the lottery if you don't play it? Um, you need to get involved and try to uh, achieve those things based off of, like your research. Just, like, I, I wanna go work for a gaming company. What do I need to know? Um, I wanna be a security person at a gaming company. Well, I need to know how to hack games. Um, I need to know what the common hacks are. How can I achieve that? How can I program my own? Maybe I need to set up my own experiment at home. How can I do that safely? So it's like all these questions, but you break them down into smaller chunks and achieve those slowly and slowly. You don't have to know everything about security at once. Like I said, I jumped around in my career uh, I'm learning on the job for, for vulnerability research. I don't think I'm an expert in it, um, but you know, I'm using the skills that I know, my foundational skills to apply it to the job and, and learning on the job. So all of these things, it's not, it's not as scary as you think. Um, you just have to have your foot in the door somewhere, someone to guide you, um, find a mentor, uh, find uh, open, uh, open source material out there and just get started. Just jump right in. I love that. Um, it, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was I was going to say the the other thing is there's so many communities that you could try to get involved with. Obviously, Oasis is a wonderful one. There's lots of things if you're not familiar with B sides. B sides has a lot of local conferences um, in in you know, different states, different cities. And so building a network and having someone that can show you the ropes, um, I would encourage people to also consider that. That's how you can start to learn. You know, Amanda's giving you a wonderful idea about some of the stuff she does, but if you're interested in other things, trying to build your, your network up. And I did a, a program many years ago that talked about 
uh, the difference between men and women. And a man will call someone up they knew 20 years ago and be like, hey, your company's hiring. Would you refer me? Where women would tend to not do that. They'd say like, oh, I didn't, haven't talked to them for 20 years. That seems kind of weird to call them up. But they say that if it, most women will try to help each other. Most people will try to help each other. So I encourage you not to be afraid to ask someone for help, not be afraid to reach out to someone you knew 10 years ago, and because usually people are willing to, to, to lean in and help you. So I encourage you all to, to do that. So thanks for sharing that, Amanda. The next one I know is going to be near and dear to a couple of people's heart. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Abalasha, but I'd love to have Olivia weigh in as, uh, as well. We have a we junior, have a junior at that too, who is with your alma um, um, And they're going to be finishing their final internship this summer, and they're going to be looking for a full-time role in cybersecurity. Do you have any tips or advice to keep in mind as I begin my career journey? So can we start with you, Abalasha? Yeah, and it is near and dear to heart, as I mentioned. Um, uh, so, you know, go Boilers. Uh, the, there is, I've had a very, very good positive experience. And um, as Amanda was also saying, there is a lot of diversity in cybersecurity. Um, and when I was at Purdue, it was looking at number theory, cryptanalysis, looking at, um, you know, compilers and looking at biometrics and so on. So depending on the area that, and very similar to what Amanda and Stephanie just mentioned, building a network over there and reaching out to people who are experts in the area that you have looked into, um, my suggestion would be to um, look at those focused areas and find experts and start uh, participating either in conferences. Typically in academia, uh, we have very strong ACM, IEEE, uh, you know, conferences uh, like CCS or security and privacy. You can definitely take a look at that. And um, that's how I started at least a uh, long time ago in those conferences, having other researchers looking at it. But if you are also, you know, from areas like data science, and I think you can speak more on Olivia as you look at the more uh, the adversarial research, if you take in it, ML can be used in as a double-edged sword. So um, being able to look at um, some of the facilities that are there. For example, even at Purdue, they, uh, you might already know, but the Center for Education and Research, Sirius, um, it offers a lot of conferences in the campus, as well as partnering with industry or other very well-known organizations like the ACM conferences and so on. Please use those to start building that interaction um, with the community, because that's how in your junior year to junior to senior, I think it's a really great time to start building that. And by the way, I would also encourage papers and research, um, advanced research, because as you finding specialists in a field, it would start becoming really important, I think, as we go forward. So Olivia, if you would like to add and or Aditi. Yeah, I can add on to that point. I think, like Amanda mentioned, there are just so many online resources like available. That is really what's great about, I think, a lot of things in this industry and at this time. But at the same time, it can be super overwhelming Like when you're presented with that much. like You don't know where to start. So I would say just be mindful. Try not to get overwhelmed with applications and rejections. Like Thinking back to my last semester in college, it was a lot to mass apply and receive all those rejections like at once. So just kind of try to plan ahead and like almost make a roadmap to pick one or two or three of your like top resources to really dig in on. And same thing with certs, like there's so many certs out there, it can be overwhelming. So try to maybe pick just a couple and, and really focus in on it so that you don't get that overwhelmed feeling that can kind of deter and discourage you. And then on Stephanie's point, there was some statistic out there that like saying for the job application or the job qualifications that a lot of the times men will apply meeting only like 30% or a lower amount of qualifications. And whereas women will apply if they meet 100% of the qualifications. So sometimes you just need to put yourself out there and apply. And then lastly, getting involved with things like conferences really opened up a lot of doors for me. The career job fairs are huge. The speaker engagements are huge. The workshops, like hands-on interactive workshops are huge. So um, looking into tech conferences is, is a really great, was a really great investment for me personally. Yeah, and I love that a few folks asked, asked 
particularly about Microsoft, like how do you get into Microsoft? And so we dropped the the link in there for people to to check out careers. But I mean, I think you nailed it when you said don't get discouraged because, you know, there's lots of different roles out there. It's OK to keep applying. It's, you know, don't pick like that one perfect one. Find the thing that you think you, you know, either you're interested in and you have the skill sets and just be able to share that passion with a, a recruiter. That's sometimes the hardest part is getting to a recruiter. So go to the job fairs, build those connections. Even if you're maybe not ready first out of college for a company that is your, your dream company, build those connections and then get some experience under your belt and then go back to them in a couple of years because those connections will be really important for you. Um, I do want to, I, I want to go back to this one question and I, I sort of mentioned it, but um, we talked a little bit about the imposter syndrome and we, most of us deal with that at some point. Um, Aditi, I'd love to just hear from you if you have ever experienced imposter syndrome and if you did, how did you deal with it? I, I think I do it all the time. Uh, I don't think it's ever going to go away, but um, the, the strategy that really works for me is fake it till you make it. So a lot of points in my life, um, you know, I've been put in situations, given opportunities that I never thought I was ready for. But uh, as everyone's been mentioning, you learn on the job, right? Like when you're thrown into the pool, you learn to swim. So really um, saying yes to more number of things and then figuring it out on the way, um, just focusing on the next step, right? Like if you look at, uh, you know, where you are, you might feel like, oh my God, you know, this is so daunting. Uh, how am I going to do this? Um, there are so many expectations out of me. But if you just take it one step at a time, like what is it that I need to do today and focus on that rather than getting overwhelmed about uh, the 100,000 things that uh, you can do. Like a lot of times, um, you know, when at, at different points in your career, there'd be like so many opportunities and there'd be so much more um, you can do. So, you know, just focusing on the present really helps me um, to just keep at it rather than um, overanalyzing whether I deserve this or not. Um, and another thing that really works for me is having those mentors or the network of people who believe in you more than yourself. Like I've always had that one or two people who believe in me far more than I do um, to be there to always uh, encourage you to put that extra, uh, you know, ounce of belief in you that you can do it. Um, that really helps me. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing. Does does anyone have anything that they want to add on to that? If I may, I will. The one, I think um, Aditi is like the, you know, like that authenticity is so amazing and it's actually very inspiring. One thing, if I may add, is uh, it happens to all of us uh, also. Like I have a certain way of speaking and somebody said, you need to, you know, like, be much louder and you need to bang your hand like you know on the on the table to make a point is like I'm not doing that you know I can convey it in my own way so being you know and I got so much of advice uh, along those lines <laughs> throughout my career and at some point you know you don't have to you know just be yourself you're so strong you know uh, the way you are and I'm really happy how we as a community are evolving to appreciate the differences from you know and uh, the diversity um, and making sure we respect and allow for growth in that manner, so. All right, let's, um, I think we have time for one more question. So what do you suggest for people that live outside of the United States um, and the EU to advance their careers in the field and what are the available opportunities? Um, so I think, I'm not sure if we can really talk about the available opportunities. I know that we've put the Microsoft site out there, but how do you, let's just talk about maybe some of the underrepresented countries or locations. What advice would you give to, to folks that are interested in getting into cybersecurity that may not have that opportunity. Um, Amanda, what can I throw that to you? Um, I'm 
probably not the best since I live in the U.S., <laughs> but maybe uh, uh, someone on here can answer. Sure, Abalasha, how about you? A little bit, uh, because yeah, all of us are uh, U.S.-based, and it's a good pointer for us for next time also to have diversity of geo. But I think I want to call out Visas here because of the global community. Um, it's just, a, you know, I get to meet folks from all around the world in some of the visas conferences. A lot of the cybersecurity, all the all the stuff we said earlier with respect to mentoring and networking. Uh, we also, I would encourage leaders here to also reach out um, to folks in uh, areas which are not normally, you know, the most popular. Um, so, I mean, of course, we have a strong India team, but also folks in Israel, Egypt. You know, looking at across, we are all global society and we are looking at very um, diverse set of folks from especially if you are from an area with even lower resources so there are a lot of initiatives we'll take that as an action item to help provide so if you have some more detail the person who's asking the question uh, on which area we can provide you some regional uh, links and resources that would be helpful to you as as you grow, because a lot of these online content, uh, I have um, weekly sessions with uh, kids from um, from Nigeria, Kenya, as well as Thailand, all of us, you know, in odd, odd times, we are all getting together and learning from that same online content. But it would be good to learn um, from you on which area that you're looking at specifically. It really is exciting to see these new markets come out with this security talent. We did, uh, as Abalasha mentioned, we did some uh, event last week, Blue Hat and Strike, which is our internal training program. And we found our highest number of viewers were actually out of Kenya, which was really exciting to see that people are starting to, to lean in because when we think about diversity, that's the kind of talent we need. People that ha are thinking differently that can help us all learn and grow. So um, if you're not in the US or in the EU, I would encourage you, like we said, you can reach out. Um, we'd love to would love to learn more mm -hmm. and, and help you out with that. And I am gonna go ahead and um, see, we got about three minutes left. I just wanna take a moment to thank our panelists so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Also want to thank everyone who has joined us online or who is watching this virtually um, at, a, at a later time. We are excited to see this grow, this community. We know that there are jobs that are going unfulfilled. So don't be afraid to, to learn a new skill. Don't be afraid to try new things. Um, someone is asking us to reintroduce the guests so we can connect with them on social media. Um, I believe we are going to drop in the um, the announcement some different ways that you can engage on social media with folks. So that will, will help soon. You should see those coming through. Um, Lynn, if you could drop those in there, that would be fantastic. Give you everyone a moment to do that. I will, you know what, I'll just go ahead and say you can follow me on Twitter at from Steph to you. That's F R O M S T E P H. Um, Amanda, you, you want to share your Mastodon info? Yeah, it's uh, I am on the InfoSec Exchange server, so uh, it's just Malware Unicorn. Um, I you could probably just Google it, and it'll probably come up, but um, yeah, you'll find me there. Yeah, I stopped using Twitter in last year, so. <laughs> Thanks. Aditi? Yeah, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, my handle there is aditi shah infosec So linkedin.com slash in slash aditi shah infosec Perfect. Olivia? Yep, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. It's just my first name, last name on LinkedIn. Yeah. And Abalasha. And likewise, first of all, thank you for your kind comments. Uh, I really appreciate the support and yeah, Please do connect with me on LinkedIn and feel free to message. You know, please don't hesitate. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, WESIS, for having us. If you have any questions, please reach out to info at wesis.org and they will funnel any questions to us and they can also help out as well. I hope everyone has a fabulous day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.